you know, I love that I don't have to push you all or coerce you to move to the front. This is great to actually have people um, near the front of the church. Uh, let me just welcome everybody this evening. Um, you know, we have people here for the first time, and tonight it's a little bit different from a, a Sunday service. Uh, you know, we're a church on a mission, and we're really a church discovering its mission, and we're viewing these uh, next three months as an opportunity for us just to look at what our mission is from different points of view. And so if you've been here previous uh, weeks, uh, this is our third week, and uh, we thought the first week about what it means to really be trying to build a community. Last week, we thought about some of the baskets that hide the witness of the church and uh, began a conversation uh, what we can do to have a witness, more present witness in the community. And all of these are things that we're going to come back to. And uh, eventually, we're going to have to land the ship and really think about what we're doing. But right now, we're just trying to get uh, to the place where we're thinking the same thoughts and uh, can begin to just uh, ask questions, uh, look into the scriptures, and see what direction God is going to lead us. Um, but thank you all. It's wonderful to have you here. And we know that there's many at home, and uh, we welcome you as well. Uh, I've got my phone again. So later on, when it's time to ask a question, if you're not present, feel free to text a question, and I'll do my best to answer it. We're going to uh, start, we're going to sing from uh, Psalm 46, and let me just read you uh, the beginning of this song. It's a wonderful song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling an incredible statement of the confidence that we can have because God is with us. So let's stand together and let's open worship uh, with praise. We did Psalm 46 last week. That was Psalm 95. But there, 
wonderful praise, all of them. Let's uh, bow our heads and let's just also bring our hearts before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we think of that psalm that describes the mountains belonging to you, uh, that the hills and the valleys are in your hands, that you are the great God, the ruler over every other Lord in dominion and power and principality and nation and state and person and individual, that you are truly sovereign. And what a privilege it is to be able to come before you with praise, rejoicing, knowing that you have covenanted yourself to us, that you are our God, and that you delight to hear us say that. We just uh, commit tonight to you. We're seeking your face. We want to know your direction. We know that you're already doing remarkable things in this city and beyond. In humility, we just want to ask, what's our place? How can we be involved? How can we be a servant as a congregation and assist in the works that are on your heart? So open up our minds. Lord, begin this conversation among us. And we pray that the result, not just of tonight, but of the next weeks and several months to come, would be a real unity of mind, a real unity of purpose, and that we could begin to labor together, coordinated as a single body, doing things that bring praise and glory to you. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before we get started, uh, we're going to watch uh, a video. Uh, we're starting our Harvest Appeal, and so there's a video with Tear Fund, which is just going to explain uh, part of what we're raising money for. And so, John, I think you've got the video for us to watch. When God created the world, he put everything into its rightful place. Then he placed Adam in the garden, and he ordered him to cultivate, to take care of it. If we've forgotten that, we will do the opposite of what God has asked us to do. My name is Pastor Chauri from Owakuye village, Burkina Faso. We are farmers. We depend on the earth for food. But in recent years, climate change has been threatening my community. Water never used to run dry here. The trees used to produce good fruit, but not anymore. is Loyara. Agriculture is our main activity. If you have good rainfall, you have a good harvest. But if it is not good, you have nothing. The earth has become impoverished. You bring children into the world to share in your happiness. But we are poor. You see others giving things to their children. We wanted to do the same, but we couldn't. The training has been a great help. We rallied the church, encouraging them to get involved. There has been a big change. helped us during our time of suffering. The change is in our meals. That's where we have seen real improvement. Before, we had no food, but now we never miss a meal. Raising chickens helps us. I like raising chickens. There has been a change in people's spiritual lives too. People behave differently. Now they understand that they are the light of the world. People who don't believe in climate change don't want to believe. You just look back five years to when the river started to dry up, the trees disappearing, 
even the animals. I would ask people to think again. There really is a change. And the Bible invites us to be the people who take care of the environment. Even if the world ends tomorrow, I would plant a tree today. I'm going to read uh, just, just a couple of verses um, before we enter into tonight's session. So tonight, uh, we're really going to focus on the mission to raise up future leaders for the church, which means discipling the children that God has already given us. This is from uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. In these words that I command you today, shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. I'll just make sure this is on. Let's go ahead and get the... Uh, okay. One of the difficulties we have is uh, we baptize infants in this church. And there might be a variety of views uh, within the congregation about people who understand this and like it. Maybe some people don't understand it and don't like it. One of the difficulties, though, is that when you baptize an infant, you're making a statement. It's a statement that's even stronger than to dedicate a baby. You're really saying that this child belongs to God. You're not saying that this child is saved. You can't see inside their heart. But in a real sense, you're saying that our obligation is now to do exactly what Deuteronomy has told us. That even before we go out and make disciples of anybody else, that these children and these youth, they belong to God. And we have a responsibility as a community to take the things that he's revealed to us, and as we read here, to teach them diligently to those children that are part of God's covenant family. Now, I think this entails more than we often think. And it's so easy to want to see God give us all of these new faces to disciple and to imagine that, you know, even if we're not doing a very good job with the, the children that are already here, that we'll do a much better job with new people. But the truth is there's that rule that Jesus says, you know, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. And so really, the challenge, if we want to imagine discipling new people, regardless of their age, it really begins taking ownership and thinking about how do we disciple, again, the people God has already given to us. Now, I want to begin. I want to talk about the, the spiritual formation of children because I think there's more involved than what we typically think about. Now, there's really three parts. I want us to think about all three of these aspects. And the truth is, as you think about this, don't just think about children, because this is your own spiritual formation as well. You need everything I'm going to describe that children need. The first aspect is this religious instruction. Now, what do I mean by that? That's the kind of basic stuff that when you think of a Sunday school curriculum, it immediately jumps to your mind. Children, youth, and new disciples... They all need to know the basic doctrines of our faith, who God is, who Jesus is, what the atonement was. You know, they need to begin to really understand this Bible. They need to know its stories. And they need to understand the basic kind of things that Christians do, things like showing up on a Sunday, worshiping together. All of these are fundamental. But they're not the only thing that we need as believers. We also need something, and let's just call it worldview. Now, what is worldview? I'll give you a couple of pictures. Your worldview is like the set of glasses that you look through and that you see 
And it colors everything that you understand, but the truth is most of the time you don't even realize that these glasses are on. Or to put another picture, it's kind of like the fact that we're all like fish in a fishbowl and we're swimming around and we're breathing in all kinds of ideas, all kinds of things, but we don't realize that these affect how we behave, how we think. Now we're going to see the danger if you don't give people a worldview that undergirds their religious beliefs. It can end up being disastrous because that's what really makes plausible the other things that we begin to believe as Christians. But that's not all you need. You know, we're not just thinking beings, walking around reasoning. When I say identity, there's two other features of you and of our children that we have to understand. And this is what really forms who they are. First, what they love is vital. But the way we love as people is we get involved with particular communities. And the community that we belong to ends up informing what we love. And then what we love determines how we live. I'll give you a superficial example and then we'll go to a deep example. Here's a superficial one. The connection between community and love. I've used this before on a Sunday morning. I mean, take my kids. You know, when my kids were in the United States, when they were in South Louisiana, everybody talked about American football all of the time. And as you breathe in this community, and as you're part of this community, you can't help it. It's infectious. You care a lot about American football. Now, what happens when you move to Scotland? <laughs> and nobody even knows what American football is, or any of the teams, or any of the players. Without even realizing what happens, you start caring less. And now that you're part of a new community, now everybody's talking about football, and everybody's talking about rugby, and what happens? You find yourself interested, caring, practicing these new games that you didn't care about just a few months ago. Now that's a superficial, let's go deep. Have you ever asked the question why you care so much about achievement? Why you care so much that you've done something that people say, you know, contributes something significant to the world. Did you ever receive a lecture that said, you are what you do with its main theme? I bet you didn't. You know what happened is you were born into a society, and the society you were born into, it values achievement. And so ever since you were a child, you were just breathing this in. I mean, you couldn't get through school without that under message that what your grades are determines the quality of your person. And so again, without ever having really thought about it, by the time you're an adult, your love, what you're passionate about, it's been programmed by the world you live in. And if you had been born in the middle of Africa, in certain villages, guess what? You wouldn't care that much about achievement because that's not what that community values. So what we need, we need to have certain beliefs, we need a worldview that underpins it, but we also need that deep part of ourselves, what do we really care about? And what's the community that shapes our love? All three of these things have to come together if we're really going to think about shaping somebody's life. Now let's think about the danger of inadequate training. Let's think about what would happen if we took seriously the call to give instruction to our children. So we taught them the doctrines of the church. And we taught them the stories of the church. But here's what we never did, is we never helped them develop a worldview that made sense of those beliefs. What would happen is we would basically construct a house of cards that could immediately be blown over. I remember watching a film, it was several months ago, it was a comedy. It was one of these th just throwaway comments in the middle of the film where somebody's making a joke and says, well, why don't you pray? And the person says, well, I believe in science, not God. I mean, such a stupid comment. <laughs> and yet, if you're not prepared for that, it can all of a sudden make you ask the question, well, maybe nothing I believe is actually believable and credible. You know, you have to actually understand and view the world in a particular way to not be surprised by what the Bible teaches and to actually recognize that it's credible. You can believe in it. 
This is why it's so, much, so important that, yes, that we have the doctrine, but we also teach them a vision of the world that actually corroborates, makes sense of, and validates what we're teaching them. Let's think about it from another angle. What would happen if we uh, did all of this religious instruction? So again, we're teaching doctrine. We teach Bible studies, and we're even given some of the worldview stuff. But what we don't provide is we don't give them a loving community where they really belong and where belonging with us actually shapes what they care about. What then happens? Well, guess what? They're just going to drift away because the world's going to actually shape what they love and value. Let's think this morning or this afternoon I was uh, talking to somebody who's, you know, working with some of these Afghans who are arriving into Scotland. You know what's so interesting about an immigrant? If you take an immigrant from Afghanistan and if you put them in the middle of Scotland, if all of their contact is with Scottish people, what happens? How much of their Afghan culture are they really going to maintain? They're going to be Scottish. They're going to act Scottish. They're going to talk Scottish. They're going to think Scottish. They're going to love in a Scottish way. Now, what happens if you take an Afghan child and you put him, yes, in Scotland, but he's surrounded with an Afghan community and with family and with friends? How much of that culture is he going to retain? A whole lot of it. See, these kids, they don't just need intellectual formation. Yes, they need that, but they also need a community that's going to love them and that by belonging and living among these people, that's going to shape their deep sense of who they are as they're out there in the world. Now again, let's just look at it from another angle. What happens, again, if we give them the loving community, they really feel like they belong among us, but all of a sudden we get light on the teaching, the doctrine, the Bible study. Well, what then happens? You see this all the time. You see these churches, they grow up, and they've got fantastic community groups. These new people, they come apart. They love being Christians. But as you look into their life, there's incredible inconsistencies. <laughs> you know, there's relationships that are so contradictory to what you would find God telling us to do in His Word. You think, how can that happen? Well, again, they've been loved well. They've just not been taught well. And what we need is we need all of these things to come together. Now, let's think about some challenges. <laughs> because as we move towards solution, and again, we're not just thinking about children, we are thinking of children, but we're thinking about just discipleship in general. What are the big challenges that we face? Well, think about that religious instruction. Think about all of the doctrine, all about the gospel, all about the Bible that we need new disciples to learn. And again, that begins with these children in this room. One of the difficulties is Sunday school is fantastic. But those of you that teach Sunday school, you felt this already. It's just not enough. There's so much more to teach and to impart than we have time to communicate. And that's a real problem that we have to think about. Now let's think about the next bit. How about this worldview thing? Now this is a massive challenge. The fact that those who are in charge of actually shaping the worldview of children and youth, this is now secular institutions. That all we have to do is we have to read through the curriculum and we can see, wait, that's not what we believe. Wait, that actually pulls the rug from what we do believe and so there's not just as if they're not teaching what we'd like them to teach, there's actually something opposed that makes it difficult for them to believe. And so the worldview, and it's not just school, it's everything in our culture, is making it more and more and more difficult for our children, for our youth, to really believe with conviction the things of God's Word. And again, there's a further problem. Let's think about this deep identity. There's a couple of facets. We have to understand this about the modern world if we're going to disciple youth and children well. There are two things. We take them for granted, but they're so abnormal. 
They're just modern Western phenomena. It's not how people lived before. One of the things that's so new is really the role that peer culture plays in our children's lives. I mean, if children just grow up in any society before, you know, 100, 200 years ago, what's normal is they grow up with a whole variety of relationships defining who they are. They live in a village. They live in a community. They live among uncles and aunts and grandparents and cousins and neighbors, and all of these people feed into their identity. Now, one thing that's so hard about the modern world is kids live in a sea of their peers, and that's the dominant influence that really shapes them. So if you look at just social scientists as they study, and again, they ask this question, is it nature or is it nurture? What's the dominant influence on the identity of youth today? What's so interesting is the answer again and again is neither. Kids just become like their peers because that's the group that really identifies and shapes. Now what's scary is what shapes peer culture among youth is pop culture. Right? It's actually just the things of music, in a film, of television, of consumption, that this tells youth what they should live for, and it's so infectious, it's hard to not breathe in. Now just think about this. We've got to own the challenge that really what we have traditionally at our disposal, it's not adequate for the need at hand, which is why we have to think so deeply about the needs, yes, of our children, of our youth, and of the people who are going to come into this church. Now, we don't want to leave with a problem, right? I don't want to leave anybody depressed. So let's think about solution. Where do we go from here? I mean, it, we've got to be honest, first of all, right? We can't cut corners. Uh, we can talk about maybe I'm wrong. Maybe those three aspects aren't all needed, but if they're all needed, what does it take to disciple children well? Well, let's start with religious instruction. The first thing is we have to, as a congregation, set up parents to be able to disciple their children. And there's a simple reason for this. Well, there's two. One, as we saw in Deuteronomy, it's actually primarily their responsibility. That's what's spoken of in Deuteronomy. That's what's spoken of in Proverbs. That's what's spoken of in Ephesians, that moms and dads have a responsibility to disciple their children. And so we have to set them up so they can do that work because we'll never have the time that they have with their children, which is why we can't replace them. At the same time, though, We've got to partner with them. We've got to partner for them, with them for multiple reasons. One reason is because we're going to have new Christians come into our congregation. They're not going to have what they need to be able to impart it. And so they're going to need a lot of help from those of us that have benefited from decades of discipleship in the Christian faith. But it's not just the new Christians. There's aspects of what these youth need that not every mom or dad is really going to feel competent to teach. I know what happens. The mere mention of the wor word worldview, right? You're just, you know, your eyes start spinning. You know, what is this worldview thing? How on earth? I can teach Daniel in the lion's den, but how am I going to actually, you know, set up my child so they're not intimidated by modern science? I can't do that. And that's where we have to actually partner and help to make sure these youth get things that maybe their parents won't be able to provide. But there's something that goes back to a couple of weeks ago. I want to throw it in here too. Because I want us to continue to think this way. Part of what we're trying to communicate to our children, it's not just a set of ideas. It's more than that. There's also key practices that are shaping influences for the Christian life. And I'll give you an example of where this uh, goes wrong. I love Christianity Explored. I've used Christianity Explored in a lot of different settings. One-on-one, -on -one, small groups in the home, you know, bigger settings. I love Christianity Explored. But consistently, I run into one problem with Christianity Explored. You see, what you do is you take people outside of a church setting and you begin to meet with them and they love that. And you talk about the gospel, and they love the gospel. And then when it's all over and done with, you say, okay, come back with me to church. And they say, I don't like that. 
Nobody said that was part of this Christianity thing. I just want the Jesus, but I don't have to show up on Sunday. And some more discipleship went wrong because they thought you could remove the message from the community and you can't. And so part of what we have to do with our children and what you often see is children are always taken out of the communal practices to do their own thing. Whereas part of what they need as they're able is to be integrated so they can know being a Christian, yes, it's believing. It's also doing things that are really important if you're going to be committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how about this identity deal? You know, how do we actually begin to shape that deep love that governs the lifestyle of our children? How do we give them you know, this community that can do that kind of thing. And one of the things that we really have to recognize is the importance of embedding our children in a multi-generational family. I said earlier, there's something bizarre at the way teenagers in the 21st century only hang out with teenagers. Children only hang out with children. We might think that's normal, but look across the world and look through history. It's not normal. And it's actually dangerous because what happens is children begin to look to their peers for a love that their peers don't have for them. And all kinds of disaster relates when I'm looking to you to affirm and validate and love me in a way that you don't give me and then I'm filled with shame and loathe myself. What they need is a community that really loves them. They need spiritual cousins. They need spiritual aunts and uncles. They need spiritual grandparents. They need a church that's really a family that will provide a kind of love so when they go out into that environment with all of their peers at school, they feel secure because they know their identity is not provided by that false artificial crowd that they're actually defined by Jesus and by His family, by us. We've got to put them in a multi-generational family. And something else that's so vital, and many, probably all of uh, the families in the church to some extent do this already, is we've got to set up our children with Christian friends. I don't need to convince you of this. You know this is the case. You know, most of our children, when they go to school, they feel like they're the only Christian. In their class, they might feel like they're the only Christian in their school. That's a really hard place to be. You don't need a lot of friends. You need a few people that now and again you can look in their eyes and say, you see what I see. Okay, now we can go out there. And if we're the only ones, we can support each other. They need that. And friends, this is where making sure that our kids, you know, that they do have good activities together, they do get to Christian camps, that they have those moments where they can be among other Christians and they can feel affirmed by their own peers. This is going to be vital for shaping that deep identity. And again, I'm just going to throw this one out. And this is <laughs> a little bit too much. We've got to shape their worship. There's something called life-on-life -life discipleship. Life-on-life -life discipleship, it's when, you know, you're not just sitting at a table talking about the Bible. That's important. But it's when you say, hey, come into my life, follow me through my day, be a part of my normal activities, and stuff's just going to rub off. And yes, we'll have those times in front of the Bible, but they're going to be more meaningful because you care about me and I care about you in a way that isn't just, you know, defined by a particular meaning. This is why if we want this identity of our children and of new people to really take shape, you know, we need the sort of things where we're taking them out on hill walks, where they're a part of our home groups, they're a part of our ministry teams, they go out on service, they're in our homes for hospitality, all of that's so vital for really creating that sense of belonging and really helping to shape that deep love that's so important for a sense of identity. Now, here's the hard one. They're all hard. But I can't get around this. That worldview thing is not unimportant. And I'll be honest, this is a massive gap in Scotland right now. 
I can point to any number of churches and organizations that, for example, you know, when it comes to evangelism or when it comes to church planting, you know, they've got all kinds of stuff up and running, and all you've got to do is partner with them. But if I ask the question, who is training youth in a Christian worldview in Scotland? Honestly, if you know of the organization, please let me know. It's not there, which is absolutely scandalous because this is the country of John Knox, of Thomas Chalmers, of so many great Christian intellects, century upon century. Now, what do our children need? Again, I'm not pulling any punches tonight. If we want them to be ready for uni, what do they need? Well, let me explain what I mean by a philosophy of science. We don't have to teach them science, but they have to know the limits of science. They have to be able to see when scientists are being arrogant and acting as if they know more than they actually do. They need to actually see that you don't have to choose between science and faith. In fact, a lot of the greatest scientists, they never felt such a pressure. And so we've got to make sure they've got a framework that makes sense of all of that. How about a retelling of history? Do you know the history, the narrative that our kids are going to pick up from school and university? It's basically that the church has in, been involved, implicated, and has been responsible for every atrocious thing that has happened in Western civilization for the last 2,000 years. They're only going to hear about the ugly stuff. Nobody's going to tell them about all the wonderful ways the world has been changed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that there's just an incomparable difference between what we know of as the world and what was the case before the resurrection of Jesus. Somebody's going to have to give them a story that says, actually, yes, has the church made mistakes? Of course. But there's a beauty to how God has used the church through time that we don't have to be ashamed of. That's important. How about this different vision of humanity? You know, just pick the obvious topic, sex and sexuality right now. You know, we think that the humanities are not important topics, but actually, what are we as human beings? What is our design? What gives us purpose, fulfillment, happiness? There's wonderful things that we can talk about there. But it's not going to sound like the things that they're going to pick up from the world around them in their present generation. Guys, how about an apologetics? How about them being ready so that when somebody, you know, throws out an inane comment like, why do you believe in the Bible? This book wasn't just written a thousand years ago by some medieval monk in a monastery. That they actually understand how this book came along. That they actually understand that you can look at the evidence for the resurrection and walk away more convinced that faith is not a blind leap, that actually God uses reason. And that we can have confidence in the things that we believe. That's important as they go out into the world. And of course, how about just this critique of pop culture? So that, you know, as they're listening to the music that they're going to listen to, as they're watching the films that they're going to watch, that they're not just imbibing a philosophy of life, but they can actually see through it and say, oh, actually, Disney, you just lied to me. <laughs> That's not the route to fulfillment or whatever else. These are not small things. These are the kinds of things that they're going to need to be ready to walk out into that world right outside the building. And guess what? They're the things you need as well. Now, I know it's a lot. Let's talk about some of the big threats. What's the stuff that's going to keep us from really taking Deuteronomy 6? You know, Deuteronomy 6 is about instilling, again, a deep identity among God's covenant children. Well, probably one of the biggest threats is just a lack of will. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. This is a lot, and it is a lot. But look around. Don't you think they're worth it? Don't you think the kids that are going to come in, that they're worth it? And so let's not let a lack of will be what impedes this. How about this one? Preference for quantity over quality or more over the mature. Isn't there something in our hearts that, you know, we just prefer to see a new disciple, <laughs> that we would love this whole church to be filled with new faces, but could we disciple them well right now? The answer is probably no. I think if we're faithful in the little things and the things that we've been given, God's going to give us more. And so again, let's just not prioritize the new. Let's be grateful for what God's already given us. Here's another big threat. 
I think we're pretty good at not doing this, but it's always a danger, and it's segmenting the congregation. Now, there are moments when you want to take the youth and do something just with the youth. That happened this afternoon. That's wonderful. They had a picnic together. But we've got to be careful not to be one of those congregations that's always pulling the youth and always pulling the children and not wanting to include them in our ordinary life. We want more of what we had at the church picnic a few weeks ago where we really are a church family. And you all have that in your DNA already. So I don't need to belabor that point. And here's one. <laughs> Overestimating fun and relevance. You know, we can think sometimes that boredom is the greatest danger to our children. It's a danger. <laughs> it's not the greatest danger. These kids feel persecuted at times during the week for being identified as a Christian on a sports team or at the school classroom or elsewhere. We've got to recognize that, you know, they need something more. And so there's nothing wrong with fun. There's nothing wrong with focusing on relevance, but it's that deeper stuff that we've got to make sure is really shaping who they are. If we don't give them that, it's like sending them out into battle with no armor on. That's a massive liability. But here's the other side. <laughs> underestimating fun and relevance. You know, one of Satan's favorite tactics is to say God's a killjoy. You know, Christians really should have more fun than anybody else. We know how to have fun the best. We know who made us. And so we don't want to say that that's not important. It's hugely important. And so yes, we want lots of fun and relevant talk and let them ask their questions. And here's a big one. It's just ignoring the influence of secular institutions. This doesn't mean that we have to be afraid of them. It doesn't mean that we have to avoid them. But it does mean we have to just not be naive, right? To see the clear writing on the wall and to recognize this is why it matters so much. This is why we've got to raise you know, the stakes a little bit. This is why what was done 50 years ago is inadequate because back then the institution supported the identity. It was an assistant. And now it's the opposite. It's really an opponent. And so that's why we've got to do things that maybe haven't been done in a very long time in order to make sure that they're prepared. And we cannot be naive about that. I don't know. I've said enough about that. Now, in just a second, I'm going to give you an opportunity um, to ask some questions. But, you know, we're thinking about all kinds of things over these weeks. We thought about, again, building a community, a community of love that's shaped by certain practices. We're going to come back around to that. We thought about being a church on a mission last week, and again, just some of the obvious things, the baskets that, uh, put a, uh, that blind our witness, and again, we can come back, and we're going to be talking about that as well. But if we're thinking about, okay, there's that question, what can we offer that's distinctive to the church in Edinburgh? You know, one of the things I think we can really offer is we can lead the way with figuring out how do we disciple really, really well. Part of that's going to be with our children and youth, and some of that's going to be with new believers coming in, but this is something that isn't given enough focus. And so again, not that we're trying to compete, not that we're trying to be better, but as other churches are particularly gifted with maybe church planning, or they're particularly gifted in some other area of maybe reaching you know, a social need within Edinburgh, we might be a congregation particularly suited at helping to really shape the identity of children, of youth, and of new Christians of all ages. And I think that could be a massive contribution to the church and the mission of God in Edinburgh and in Scotland. All right. Um, so there's probably more, more than you were bargaining for. Um, but those of you at home, if you'd like to text a question, uh, I've got my phone on. Uh, my number, it's 077-544-3182. And uh, feel free to text a question. Um, we're not always going to have this format. Um, again, I hope that eventually we start shifting the shape and getting more discussion and, and nailing down more ideas, but we're still at that point of just trying to get clarity and communicate and let you all be a part of a discussion. So, let me just open up. Are there any questions this evening? Ooh. Yes. Yes. 
That's a wonderful reminder. I think that's, that's just what we, we need to add to this discussion. Roy Gibson was reminding us, again, that the, the, the more or less the gates of Hades will not prevail, right? That, uh, that we're on the winning side, we're not on the losing side. And that's really, really important for us to remember. Any other comments or questions? Yes, and Chris. Yeah, that's a great point. And Chris was uh, asking, how do we, you know, it's true for all of us. Um, I certainly can't identify with being a Scottish teenager. <laughs> you know, uh, we're past teenage years. Many of us don't have children anymore, and maybe haven't had children. How do we begin to understand what their issues are, and how do we create an environment where they can uh, ask questions and help us to understand so we know what they're struggling with? And uh, I think as we come back around to the kind of community groups or the house groups, um, that we're thinking about it. As we think about shaping this family, that we have to have these, these places where uh, you know, children aren't just you know, pushed to the side while we do the adult stuff, but where we can actually you know, have them a part in a way that we can begin to understand. And I think that's a great point uh, to, to figure out and to come back to how do we create relationships close enough so they can be honest and so we can hear them and really meet their needs accordingly. Yes. Uh, we often succeed and learn from making, by making a lot of mistakes. Yes. Uh, and uh, it's not easy when you be you as humiliated and falling apart in your back. But years ago, centuries ago, a Scottish king was running for his life. He went to Turkey and he was almost uh, in the spear, and then he saw a spider swinging to the other side, couldn't make it, swinging again. Fifty times later, the spider made it, and so he said, well, go and read the English. I need it. All right. <laughs> our chief motivator. You're going to be giving uh, our speeches as we begin to move forward. I think there's a question in the back. Is there a handout? No? Okay. Any other... Other questions? Yes, Andy. So the world we think is massive and right. big for us as, as, as adults as well for, for children. It's also something you've thought about. What kind of resources are out there for us to begin thinking this so that we could even begin to start? What, what things have you found helpful in trying to get your head around some of this stuff? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a topic that we have to, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel with everything. I think there's strengths and weaknesses to, to, to different churches and different cultures. And uh, we, we could uh, beat up the American church for a lot of obvious things. I think one thing that's been interesting is that's been something that's been very much a focus for 20, 25 years. And so uh, even as we think about some of the curriculum and some of the things that we, we use, you know, there, there are some really good resources that we can pull in um, in a variety of ways. And so that is, it's a big topic. 
Um, and, you know, there's need uh, to think about, you know, what kind of forum would we even be able to talk about these things? But there are, there are good resources and good ministries that we can piggyback from and uh, videos and all the rest of it to help with some of these questions. So, yeah. Let me just see. I think we've got a, a text. Um, we've got a, a good recommendation. Yeah, Nancy, Percy's Total Truth. It is good. Um, the question, some Christians are very negative about teaching apologetics. Uh, how do you change this attitude? Um, and the truth is, that would be new to me. So I, uh, when we talk about defending our faith, um, I'd be interested to hear, you know, where that uh, skepticism of, of Christian apologetics comes from. Um, but I think most of us would agree that children need to be able to answer the hard questions uh, they're given, or at least know people they trust that they can go to and talk to honestly about such questions, and not just ignore those questions and wish that they would go away. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Aaron. Thinking about the, the issue of worldview again, what, where would you see a, a good, I mean, how would, you, how would you start that kind of conversation with, with a young person, with a child? I mean, what would be some of the entry points? Yeah, I think we can connect with what Aunt Chris was saying. And so Aaron's question is, how do we begin to identify these questions, these worldview questions, so we can address them? And I'll be honest. I think by about age 11 or 12, they already have the questions. And so if we can give them a place where they can be honest and say, what are you asking in your head that you're a little bit afraid actually you know, takes away the foundation of this? You know, they're going to start to have those questions already. And so beginning to let them, in some cases, ask the questions and then begin to give them, you know, the answers. Because one of the most comforting things about being a Christian is when you finally realize really clever people, far cleverer than we're ever going to be, have already thought through these things. They're not new, but they are questions that we have to face and that we have to find those answers for. So I think, you know, part of it is going to be just, again, having that place where they can begin to be honest. And then over time, again, we can have some sort of curriculum or something like that. Any other questions? All right, well, let's just uh, keep in mind that, uh, again, these, let's keep January in view, that uh, as of January, we want to begin to move in a direction as a congregation, and so continue to think, uh, think, really think about coming out on Saturday. I think Saturday is going to be important for us to have more discussions, so Saturday morning, 10 to 11, this mission conference, and uh, we'll continue to see. What's that? Oh, 10 to 1. 10 to 1. That was wishful <laughs> thinking. Um, well, let's, let's end with, uh, let me just see real quick. I think that's a question, uh, and then we'll move to praise. Um, okay, the question is, how much of what has been discussed will be dealt with on Saturday? Um, you know, in many ways, uh, we're going to be coming at it from, again, more angles. We've got David Meredith, who's going to give us a short talk, um, and he's, we're going to let that feed into some discussion. I'm going to interview uh, a couple of people um, who've done a lot with mission, uh, and then we've also got Andy Chittick, uh, who's going to talk to us, really, what does it mean to live missionally, to, to really view, view evangelism as a whole life concept. So there should be some, some really interesting things. So we're not yet, for that question, we're not yet there where we're going to get all the answers and make it all concrete, uh, but we are at that place where we're co continuing to get on the same wavelength. Well, let's end with praise. Uh, let's forget about the problems. Uh, remember the so-called giants of the land? Uh, they're actually, they're the grasshoppers. They're tiny as we see the stature of our God, and so we're going to uh, stand, and we're going to worship, and we're going to sing, How Great Thou Art.
I hope everybody remembers how the Great Commission begins. Not with the go, but all authority has been given to me. And so it's in recognition that Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth that we go forth to make disciples uh, in His name. And so may we go out with all the confidence, all of the hope, and all of the joy of knowing that what we do, we do in His strength and for His glory. Amen. Yeah, Hannah's